It's a real pleasure uh, to be here. I'm, I was, I'm acutely conscious of the fact as I listened uh, both to a previous speaker and also the ones before that everyone has been speaking about very consequential and high-minded things this morning, and I'm not going to do that at all. Um, in fact, I intend to give what I'm sure will be the most solipsistic talk ever at a Google zeitgeist. I simply want to talk about why on earth I decided uh, to say yes and come here. Um, here's the situation. I, I'm a writer. Part of what I do to make my living is I go and give speeches at conferences like this, and I, I, I get paid, right, as one would. And um, it's that money that I use to, to make my living. So how much is Google paying me for this? Zero. It's a company with, what, 50 billion dollars in the bank, and they don't have a dime for poor little old Malcolm. Now, we could talk at length about what this says about Google, but I'd, that's not what interests me. What interests me is what that says about me. Um, why on earth would I say yes under such a circumstance? Why, you know, I'm, I'm busy. My time is really valuable. I, why did I fly all the way out here uh, across the country to give away my intellectual property for free. Um, in fact, it wasn't even free. I had to print out my speech this morning in the business center, and uh, this is the bill. It cost me uh, $9.87. It's costing me to be here. <laughs> now, you can say that I came here because there's all kinds of interesting people here, which is true, but if, you know, I don't mean to cast any dispersions on any, dispersions on any of you, but my life is lousy with interesting people. I got more interesting people I know what to, so you can say, well, maybe I should have come here. I should come here because I can make contacts that will help me you know, in the business world. I'm not in the business world. I don't need to meet a VC. I work out of my apartment. If I want to renovate my kitchen, I'll just go to the bank for a loan. There's no, it doesn't make any sense, in other words, um, for, for me to be here. So why did I say yes? Well, the answer is that, th that this conference is run by Google, one of the most prestigious and successful uh, companies in the world. I would not have agreed to speak for free at a Yahoo conference, would I, right? <laughs> so, in other words, my decision to do something that is not in my best interest was caused by my association with an elite institution. And this is what I want to talk about uh, today. Um, it's an argument that I make in my new book, David and Goliath, which in further proof of how baffling my decision was to come here is not available for sale at this conference. Um, I like to call this problem uh, elite institution cognitive disorder, or uh, EICD. And it's simply that elite institutions screw us up in all kinds of ways that we're not um, uh, uh, always conscious of. And since the theme of this morning's session is imagine a better world, I want to try and imagine what the world would look like if we freed ourselves of the scourge of EICD. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a couple of examples of EICD in action. Um, the, but let me start with a very thorny question of, uh, of science, and math, science and math education in this country, STEM as we call it. Um, we have a problem in turning out enough science and math graduates, right? Uh, in this country. And it's not for lack of interest, by the way, among high school seniors. Lots and lots and lots of high school seniors want to get science and math degrees, but approximately half of them drop out by the end of their second year. So we have a persistence problem in science and math education in this country. So the question is why? Why do so many kids drop out? Well, the obvious answer is that science and math are really hard and you need to have a certain level of cognitive ability to master those subjects, and we don't have enough smart kids, right? So, um, uh, so if, you, if that's true, uh, if science and math education is a function of, uh, we should be able to see in the statistics that persistence is a function of your cognitive ability. Right? So let's take a look. I have, by the way, this is the first time in my life I've ever used PowerPoint. This is like, it's a fantastic moment for me. I feel like I finally joined the 20th century. It's really kind of amazing. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is, uh, this is I've just chosen Hartwick College as a proxy for American colleges for totally random reasons. 
Hartwick is a small liberal arts college in upstate New York. And what we have here is a distribution of math SAT scores by among the people who are intending to major in science and math. And what you can see is that there is quite a wide range of native math ability among the kids entering the freshman uh, STEM programs at Hartwick. Right? So, what we would, so what do we see when we, when we look at uh, the who ends up graduating with a STEM degree? What we see is that at Hartwick College, the kids with, in the top third, with the top third SAT scores, end up getting well over half of the STEM degrees, and the kids with the bottom scores end up getting very few of the STEM degrees. Those kids over there are dropping out like flies. Right? This would seem to suggest that our original hypothesis that persistence is a function of cognitive ability is true. And this would also, we can also go further, we can say if this hypothesis is true, as we go to more and more selective institutions, we should see a very different pattern of persistence. We should see less kids dropping out because the kids are all smarter. Right? So let's go to Harvard. These numbers are a few years old. But at Harvard, you can see that the bottom third of math SAT scores among kids doing science and math are equal to the top third at Hartwick. The dumb students at Harvard are as smart as the smart students at Hartwick. So you'd think everybody at, Har at Harvard should be getting a math and science degree, right? Why would they drop out? Everyone's so smart. What do we see? Oh, dear. What we see is the exact same pattern at Harvard that we saw at Hartwick. The smart kids are, the top kids are getting all the degrees. The kids at the bottom aren't getting any degree. They're dropping out like flies, right? Even though these kids are brilliant, right? So uh, what's happening? Well, clearly what we're seeing here is that uh, persistence in science and math is not simply a function of your cognitive ability. It's a function of your relative standing in your class. It's a function of your class rank, right? Those kids who are really, really brilliant don't get their math degree, not because uh, that is a function of their IQ, but as a function of where they are in their class. And by the way, if you look at any college you want, you will always see, regardless of the level of cognitive ability among the students, you will always see the same pattern. The kids who get the science and math degrees are the ones in the top of their class, and the kids in the bottom of their class never do. Look at over that bottom third, um, uh, 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 the, the bottom third chart over there. So the name given for this phenomenon um, among psychologists is relative deprivation theory. And it describes this exceedingly robust phenomenon, uh, which says that as human beings, we do not form our self-assessments based on our standing in the world. We form our self-assessments based on our standing in, the, in our immediate circle, on those in the same boat as ourselves. Right? So a classic example of relative deprivation theory is which kind of country, which countries have the highest suicide rates? Happy countries or unhappy countries? And the answer is happy countries. Right? If you're morbidly depressed in a country where everyone else is really unhappy, you don't feel that unhappy, right? <laughs> you're not comparing yourself to the universe, the whole universe of people out there. No, you're con comparing yourself to your neighbors and the kids at school, and they're unhappy too, so you're sort of fine. But if you're morbidly uh, depressed in a country where everyone is jumping up and down for joy, you are really depressed, right? That is a very, very, very profoundly serious place to be. And so as a result, um, you get that sad outcome uh, more often. So what's happening at Harvard then is the kid in the bottom third of his class at Harvard does not say, rationally, I am in the 99.99th percentile of all students in the world when it comes to native math ability, even though that's true. What that kid says is, that kid over there, Johnny over there, is getting all the answers right, and I'm not. I feel like I'm really stupid, and I can't handle math, so I'm going to drop out, get a fine arts degree, move to Brooklyn, work, make $15,000 a year, and break my parents' heart, right? <laughs> so what is the implication of this? The implication of this is that if you want to get a science and math degree, don't go to Harvard, right? In fact, 
we can run the numbers on this. Mitchell Chang at UCLA recently did the numbers, and he says, he, as a rule of thumb, your odds of graduating, persisting, successfully getting a science and math degree uh, fall by two percentage points for every 10-point increase in the average SAT score of your peers. So if you're a kid and you have a choice between uh, if you and University of Maryland is your safety, University of Maryland has 150, as on average, SAT scores are 150 points lower at Maryland. That means your chance of graduating with a STEM degree from Maryland is 30% higher than it would be at Harvard, right? Now, so if you choose to go to Harvard and not Maryland, you are taking an enormous gamble. You are essentially, you're essentially saying, this STEM degree, by the way, the most valuable commodity any college graduate can have in today's economy, I am going to take a 30% gamble in my chances of getting that degree just so I can put Harvard on my resume. Is that worth it? I don't think so, right? But how many kids, given a choice between Harvard and Maryland, choose Maryland? Not that many. Why? EICD. Now, why does EICD persist if it's so plainly irrational? Well, I think it's because as human beings, we dramatically uh, underestimate the cost of being at the bottom of a hierarchy. Right? Uh, and let me give you another really remarkable example of this. This is from a paper that was, just came out from a guy named John, two, two economists, John Conley and Ali Sundi, Al, Ali Under, rather. They looked at graduates of PhD programs, uh, economics PhD programs at American universities. And what they were interested in was, what is the uh, publication record of these graduates in the six years after they took an academic position? So as you know, the principal way by which we evaluate economists is uh, how, often, how, how often and how well do they publish. So what these guys did is they did a little algorithm, took the top economics journals and weighted them according to their level of prestige and came up with a number of how many your sort of score in the six years after graduation. So we get this chart here. And what you can see, first of all, look at the 99th percentile. So what this says is, the, 90, the kids who are in the 99th percentile of their PhD program at Harvard, MIT, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Stanford, Chicago. The 99th percentile, that's what they publish. The Harvard students publish 4.31 journal articles in their first six years after graduation. That's amazing, right? Astounding number. Same with MIT, 4.73, all the way down the list. What we see here is that the best students at the very best schools are extraordinary. And that comes as no surprise. You just saw Larry Summers here. I don't know where he went. Larry Summers, that's Larry Summers, right? Brilliant, genius. We knew that. <laughs> Let's look at the 85th percentile. Now, the 85th percentile at these schools, these are schools that might take two dozen PhD students every year. So if you're in the 85th percentile in the MIT economics program, you're the fifth or sixth best student in your class. That's really smart, OK? The 85th percent student at MIT, or at Harvard, let's do Harvard, publishes basically one paper in their first six years versus 4.31 in the top student. So the gap between one and five is enormous, right? It's 5x. Now let's go down to the 55th percentile at Harvard. So the 55th percent at, percentile at Harvard is the, let's say, the uh, 12th best person at the greatest economics program in the world. They could arguably say they are one of the 20 top PhD economics students in the world, right? Look at their publication rate, 0 0.07. Basically, they're not publishing at all. By any standard by which we judge academic economists, these people are complete failures, right? Now, I've picked lousy schools. <laughs> and I've, I've started with Toronto, which is where I went to school. So this is a, uh, a, little, uh, uh, a little masochistic moment where I basically confess to how paltry my academic pedigree is. I've also picked BU. And then I've also picked non-top 30 is simply all the schools that are so terrible, I can't bring myself to name them. So we've, <laughs> we've aggregated them all. 
So these are schools that if your child, anyone in this room, if your child said, yeah, we're going to go to one of these schools, you would weep. Okay? <laughs> what do we see here? What we see here is that the 99th percentile at these lousy schools publish more than everyone at the top schools except for the 99th percentile, right? Do you see that? Look at Toronto, 3.13. The only people who publish more than the top student at Toronto are the top students at those top seven schools. These, the top student at Boston is publishing three times more than the 80th percentile student at Harvard. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us that, uh, oh, the, before I get there, the guys who did the study, having done the study, were so stunned of what, they were seeing, of what they were seeing, that they end their, uh, their article with this whole thing about what on earth is going on with Harvard. Right? Here's a school which is collecting the most brilliant, the most accomplished, the, probably the best looking uh, graduate <laughs> students in economics uh, imaginable. I can't imagine the bar is that high, but nonetheless, it presumably is a selection criteria. Um, they gather them all together, and yet everyone, except for the very, very best students, is basically a flop. And they say, I'm quoting them, why is it that the majority of these successful applicants who were winners and did all the right things up to the time they applied to graduate school became so unimpressive after they are trained? Are we, f here's the, in this moment of, of, genu of, of genuine distress on the part of these two economists, are we failing the students or are they failing us? Right? No one's failing anyone. What you're just seeing is relative deprivation in action, right? When it comes to confidence and motivation and self-efficacy, the things that really matter when it comes to making your way in the world, relative position matters more than absolute position. Right? The 80th percentile student at Harvard looks at those kids who are smarter than him and says, I can't do it. The number one student at Missouri says, wow, I am lord of the manor. I'm going to go out and conquer the world, right? So what does it mean? Well, what it means, what it means first of all, when it comes to hiring, it means you should hire on the basis of class rank. And you should be completely indifferent to the institution attended by the applicant. In fact, we should have a don't ask, don't tell policy for the name of your undergraduate institution. It's hurting us to know that. Doesn't help us. And when you hear some institution, some fabulous Wall Street investment bank, some university say, we only hire from the top schools, you should say, you moron. That's the word. That's what the, the oh, that's not the, the previous slide. I don't know how to go backwards on slides. So, um, no, you don't want to hire from only the best. Hire from the top stu students from any school under the sun. And it also means that when it comes, if you have kids going to college, when it comes to choosing your undergraduate institution, you should never go to the best institution you get into. Never. Go to your second or your third choice. Go to the place where you're guaranteed to be in the top part of your class. Right? So why don't we do that? Well, why did I come here when it was profoundly in my self-interest not to? right? Because when we have an opportunity to join elite institutions, we are so enormously flattered and pleased with ourselves that we do things that are irrational. 